Hello, Calm Parents. Welcome back to another episode of Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam. I'm your host, Dr. Cam. Is your teen's fear of being around a lot of people, getting called on in class, or having to talk to someone new, making it feel impossible to go to school or out in public? Are you worried that they are becoming too isolated but don't know how to help? then this episode is for you. I'm joined by Mark Metry, a 24-year-old mental health advocate, Forbes featured TEDx keynote speaker, host of the Social Anxiety Society podcast, and author of Screw Being Shy. Mark's Kick Social Anxiety program helps people break free from anxiety by rewiring their brain. And today he's going to give us some tips on how to best support our socially anxious teens. Welcome, Mark. I'm so happy you could join us today. Dr. Cam, I'm so glad to be here and uh, I'm honored to be able to speak to some parents. And, you know, I honestly do what I do because throughout my entire life, I was just called like a shy, quiet, introverted kid, didn't really think much of it. And it really wasn't until I was about 18 in college to where all of a sudden I became seriously depressed. I was suicidal. I was socially isolating myself. And it really led me to just completely discover like what social anxiety is and how much it impacts people and how much of a serious problem it is. And and I did my TEDx talk uh, a few months back and the title of it was the invisible mental health epidemic that stops people from being Mm. themselves. And so thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I reached out to you because I am seeing this issue increasing after the pandemic, you know, we talked a lot about how kids are being socially isolated because they couldn't go into school. And now I'm noticing more and more kids that are struggling to get back into school and reacclimated. So this seems to be increasing. So tell, I want to hear a little bit more first about your struggles with social anxiety and how that looked and how you started overcoming it. Like that's huge. Yeah. So, you know, for me, my story, um, my parents from Egypt, they immigrated to the U.S. like a year or two before I was born. And, um, you know, at the start of my life, we moved around a lot, mostly kind of lived in the inner city. And for me, uh, you know, a time in my life that I look back on that really, really, you know, tremendously impacted me was moving to a small town around second or third grade. Um, And what was really interesting about this town was that there was no racial diversity. And this was also a time in America where it was post 9-11. And so if you were like Middle Eastern or anything like that, you know, you faced a tremendous amount of hate. And so all of a sudden I'm kind of in second, third grade and I'm in this new school and nobody looks like me physically. I'm literally the only person who looks different than anybody else. Maybe me and uh, like one or two other families in the entire town. And all of a sudden I start facing, you know, bullying, whether it was because of, you know, I don't know, just kind of racism on the discrimination side or, um, you know, just who I was. And all of a sudden, you know, what really happened was I just sort of saw myself just like slowly and slowly and slowly just like enter into this bubble where just Mm -hmm. like every single room I walked into everywhere I went to all of a sudden my brain would just tell me Mark don't look at anybody don't speak up just look down uh you know don't speak up no one really wants to hear you and that was basically my life for about 10 years and so I was that kid who was shy didn't talk to anybody wasn't a part of any clubs or sports, um, or really kind of had any meaningful friends, didn't get good grades in school, uh, was on the internet a lot, played a lot of video games, um, which I think can be bad and good. But, um, you know, that was my life. And it really wasn't until I was about 18 years old, which I kind of mentioned earlier, to where all of a sudden, I sort of saw all of these problems that I didn't really know I had, almost uh, come in front of my face. And Mm -hmm. my lifelong social anxiety really just transformed into social isolation. I like stopped talking Mm -hmm. to my family, stopped talking to any of my friends and uh, became like obese. For example, I became depressed and I became suicidal. I, you know, started experimenting with like alcohol, was eating way too much junk food, all this kind of stuff. And, um, And eventually, you know, it took me months and years to climb out of that hole that I was in. 
And that led me on this process to where I really had to understand that, you know, I have social anxiety. It's not just like, oh, you're shy or you're an introvert. Um, it's really like this, this brain condition that has been wired in my brain as a result of decades of behavior um, and, and thinking the same thoughts and feelings. And so I really went down like this crazy journey of just trying to figure out like what this was, how do I um, you know, rewire? How do I kind of help my brain? How do I get myself back? And, you know, I mean, I still sometimes get socially anxious today, but uh, I've really been able to be in a spot to where, you know, I can be myself, you know, really in front of anyone. And, uh, you know, that's like the most, that's like the best thing in the world, you know, to be comfortable in your own skin, uh, you know, to not be super anxious. And so, you know, that's kind of my story. And then, you know, what's really interesting about that too, is that, you know, and I mentioned this in my TEDx talk, but, you know, Harvard, Harvard University, they, they did this meta analysis study where they actually showed that social anxiety is one of the most common mental health issues in America. And yet it is the most correlated with social isolation, substance abuse and suicide, mm -hmm. which is like literally where I found myself. And so, um, a lot of the times I think for me, like growing up, I didn't really think about the fact that I was socially anxious or, or I had sort of just labeled it in my mind of like, oh, I guess I'm shy kind of mm -hmm. not really. Um, and then it really wasn't until, you know, I really started to see my brain turn against me. And that's really what happens with people who experience social anxiety in the long term. And so, yeah, that's my story. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, and it, it's amazing what a transformation you've made. And I think that gives a lot of parents and teens hope because as you're describing where you were at, I know a lot of kids in that place right now and a lot of parents freaked out basically seeing their kids going there. And it is kind of the spiral. Like it gets progressively worse as you get in there. And so if we're noticing this, I, I have so many questions. The first yeah. question is, how do you tell the difference? How do you know the difference between being a shy, introverted person, which is just, it's fine, right? A lot of people do mm -hmm. quite well being an introverted person and being socially anxious, which is now debilitating. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I would say is social anxiety is not random. Right. So in terms of being an introvert or an extrovert, that's really just like how your brain is kind of designed. Like you don't really have a choice for that. Like you're just born with that. Maybe you can change it. Maybe you can't. Who knows? But you're just sort of like that from the start. Whereas social anxiety, the same is not true. And so what I mean by that is, um, like all of a sudden, it's not like someone just becomes, um, socially anxious. And, and oh, let me restate that. What I mean is this. So if your kid is like around the ages of, I believe the ages, the age rate is around nine to 13. If like all of a sudden you realize a change like within them, and obviously it may be hard to tell if you're seeing them every day, but if you notice a change in them, almost like a, a turtle going back in its shell, that is a huge indicator of social anxiety. Because social anxiety, it, 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 it happens to you at a certain age. And so it's not one of those things where, you know, you're, you're, you're really born with it for the most part. It's something where around that age range, all of a sudden you see a shift. So for me personally, maybe I was an introvert, not really, um, but I was always like an active kid. I wasn't necessarily shy. I was always friendly. And then all of a sudden around the ages of, you know, from second to third grade, all of a sudden I just, my personality shifted. And so if you have noticed a shift like that, I think that is a big sign that social anxiety may be happening. And I think one of the best analogies that I've learned about social anxiety is that a lot of the times it starts off with a certain friend group or it starts off in a certain environment. So for me, it was school. But the thing is that social anxiety is like a virus mm -hmm. and just like any other virus, it spreads to every area of your body. So mm -hmm. someone can experience social anxiety at first through maybe school, through bullying, for example. Uh, and yeah, one of the, you know, some of the biggest causes of social anxiety is bullying, discrimination, 
um, having some sort of a disability that other people can see, uh, being socially ostracized. Uh, Mm -hmm. I remember there was this period um, like in second, third grade to where, um, you know, I was kind of facing this bullying and I was facing this discrimination and I kind of had like a very small group of friends. I had like three or four friends. And then I'm, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I basically remember all of a sudden, um, you know, those kids, they kind of like left my friend group and they started to hang out with the people who were bullying me and they stopped mm-hmm. talking to me. So a lot of the times facing some sort of um, like social ostracization is a very common trigger to then yeah. kind of developing social anxiety. And so, and so, yeah, so what I was saying is that social anxiety is very much like a virus. So it'll start off when you're at school or maybe with one friend group. And then it'll eventually move to other groups. And then eventually it'll be everything. And and you'll be socially anxious in front of your family, in front of your close friends, uh, everywhere you go, in front of strangers, in front of people you've seen for years. And so, and then eventually what happens is, um, you know, it kind of, the, the person who's experiencing social anxiety starts to also experience it internally in terms of um, just having like a general sense of anxiety or not trusting themselves or feeling like they have to lie to other people, not because they're liars, but because they're so afraid of what other people are going to think of them. uh, And they're like low self-esteem that they feel like they have to lie to get some source of validation. And, um, and yeah, a lot of times it leads to social isolation, which is like a whole other problem, which is a lot worse to substance abuse. Um, so it can be a huge, huge problem that is very debilitating and, and is kind of all encompassing. Yeah, it really is. And there's so much, it is so much about fear because I've even talked to kids who haven't personally had some of those situations happen to them, but they've seen others and they've now like taken that fear and they're so terrified it is going to happen. And it just kind of starts building and building and building. So if we as parents start noticing our kids, and it's so hard because during adolescence, you're like, well, how do you know the difference between them being an adolescent and, you know, kind of going up and and not? And I think what you said is, A, it's a drastic change, and B, it starts impacting all of their lives, right? Um, We start noticing this, and we start noticing them kind of pulling away. What do we do? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, it definitely depends on the person. What I would start off with is saying, um, so number one, the first thing is, um, and maybe some parents know this already, but what I would say is you should never, ever ask your kid publicly, like if they're in some sort of a social situation, or even if you are at your house, maybe you have guests over or extended family over, you should never ask them, are you shy? Or like, hey, why don't you go talk to them? Or why don't just be yourself? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times, like if you, you know, the only way to do that at an okay basis is if you, you know, are having a very friendly conversation, you kind of take them to the side, or maybe you're just having like a one-on-one, you're having a deep conversation. And then you can kind of ask them that in a friendly way. But if you ask them that question in any sort of a social situation, it could even be your family. Um, a lot of the times that is a huge trigger for social anxiety Mm -hmm. because a lot of the times, like what social anxiety actually is, is a fear of you being your real self. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask someone if they're shy, a lot of the times people who are socially anxious, they actually don't identify with being shy because they might be shy on the outside, but on the inside, they're not shy on the inside. They're just trying to figure out how do I be myself? So when someone asks them, are you shy? That's like the biggest like middle finger to them because they're trying so hard to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And yet someone doesn't see that. And they're just like, oh, you're nervous. You're, you know, someone who can't talk to people. So that's a huge trigger. So I would say Mm -hmm. step one is don't do those things. Okay. So don't ask them if they're shy or, or, oh, just be yourself or why can't you just do that? You know? And, And a lot of times I look back and And, um, you know, I think back, like sometimes like my dad would often do that to me. Um, and I think a lot of the times, obviously it's not due to like any bad reason or anything, but you know, maybe it's because he was maybe shy. So maybe he feels like he needs to help me, but he just didn't really go approach it in the right way. So I think that's number one is like, don't do those things. Um, number two, 
is, you know, like, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of this idea, but there's this idea of, you know, you can experience um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or you can experience post-traumatic growth order. Mm. And, uh, and there's like this entire like research paper about this. And so what I mean to say is that if you've talked to anybody who has experienced um, a traumatic event and, and it may not seem like being socially ostracized or kicked out or bullying is a traumatic event, but if you're a kid, uh, your brain can definitely mm-hmm. perceive it in that way. And, and that is the reality of it. You know, and it doesn't really matter what happens. It really just has to do with how they react and how they feel about it. And so anyone who's experienced any kind of like a, uh, what I would say an injury like that is they have to go through a recovery process. Mm -hmm. So the same way that if you break your leg, you fall down the stairs and, you know, our society, we have this entire system for, Hey, We'll take you to the doctor. The doctor will put you in a cast. They'll give you crutches. They'll assign you physical therapy. And then you maybe come back a month or two later and they switch out your cast for a different kind of cast. And there's like this whole step-by-step process for your body to recover. And a lot of the times with social anxiety or any kind of a traumatic event, it's the same thing, but it's not your leg, it's your brain. But we live in a society that for the most part doesn't really recognize that. And it's very hard to recognize that because- part of the the problem with social anxiety is that you want to hide everything from everyone, including your family, including the people who could help you the most. And so a lot of the times, like you have to take somebody through a recovery process. And a lot of times that can be, it's a long-term process. It doesn't look the same for everybody. But what I always try to do is I think it's really important to address somebody's uh, brain health which is like the physical state of, of the organ of the brain. And the reason why I say that is because like, if you, you know, if you get a fearful thought or if you get a socially anxious thought, you know, if you get one of those thoughts, it's not really a big deal. But if you're someone who, you know, has experienced discrimination, bullying, social ostracization, and then now you're in this environment that triggers those thoughts every single day, what happens is your brain is a very malleable plastic organ that adapts to the environment. And so what happens is now your brain at like a a physical hardware level, it's neurons, it's neurotransmitters, they're all being wired to be socially anxious. And so a lot of the times, like what happens is someone will grow up, they'll be an adult and they'll sort of realize they have social anxiety or they realize they need to do something about it. And a lot of the times they try to change their behavior and they can't really get any results. Their behavior is not changing. And I think that's because they're only trying to change their mind. They're not trying to change their brain. And so what I would say is definitely look at, you know, like your kid's brain health. And there's so many different like avenues and resources that I can, you know, talk about in terms of that. But I think that's a big one for long-term success. And I think the other part of it too Um, is also looking at their worldview. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times, one of the reasons why social anxiety is so bad is because um, from a psychology perspective, I'm sure you know this, that the way that we create our identity is through the social interactions with other people, especially at a young age. And so if you have social anxiety, that corrupts that entire process. And so now you have a skewed perception of your identity. Your self-esteem is low. Having a low self-esteem leads you to doing things that aren't really true to yourself, leads you to doing things that you normally wouldn't do, but just to receive some sort of validation, even if it's like a bad habit per se. And so a lot of the times the person's worldview in terms of how they think about themselves, in terms of how they think about other people, in terms of just their general beliefs about the world um, are, you know, for one way to say it or another, they're, they're wrong. They're, they're yeah. heavily, heavily, heavily wrong. And, and the reality is, is that human beings, we lead with belief. And so if you have this belief and you're showing up every day and you're in this toxic environment and you have these internal triggers with social anxiety, this will create like a perfect storm to where you actually have no free will. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, before I knew what social anxiety was, which wasn't until I was like 18 and I was suicidal, 
Um, I had no idea what mental health was. I had no idea what anxiety or depression was. I mean, I, I knew what they were, but I always had like a very exaggerated sense of them of like, oh, depression is someone who is like in a dark room crying all day by themselves or anxiety, is someone who can't like leave their house because they're so afraid. But a lot of times, obviously, there's different, um, you know, tones and levels to that. Um, and so what I mean by that is like, before I knew what those things were, every single day in my entire life, I would wake up every day and I would try to be confident. I would try to be myself and I would step into a classroom. I would step into a social situation. And then next thing I knew, all of a sudden, my heartbeat would start to race. Uh, my throat would be tight. It would, it would clench in. Um, I would, my, my bladder would tell me, oh, I have to run and go to the bathroom. Um, I wouldn't really be able to breathe. I'd just breathe very shallowly. And then all of a sudden, all these thoughts would start in the background of like, oh, is that person looking at me? Or like, why did they just look at me in this way? And really what happens is your, your brain and your mind, alongside like physical symptoms of like your heartbeat getting intense, this creates like this all-encompassing algorithm that makes it so that social anxiety is never um, uninstalled from your system. Mm -hmm. So that even if you think differently, or even if you want to say something differently, your brain, your, your heart, your throat actually traps you in, you're locked in. And if you don't know what social anxiety is, every single time that happens to you, you're just like, man, I guess I'm just antisocial, or I guess yeah. there's just something wrong with me, you know? And so that's part of the trick too, of like realizing that social anxiety, you know, sort of what it looks like and, and the fact that it is real. Um, and the fact that you have to go through like the step-by-step -step process, like there's no, um, obviously like there's simple tips I can give, but there's no like one thing that you can do to all of a sudden eliminate. You have to really look at it as if someone breaks their leg. You have to take them through okay. a recovery process. And the last thing that I would say is that imagine if you broke your leg and you never went to the doctor and nobody ever put it in a cast, right? So the human body is very, 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 very resilient, right? So I'm sure that your brain or not your brain, your leg, excuse me, the bone, I'm sure it would like try to fix itself somehow, right? But it might be like demented. You might have an infection, right? So a lot of the times, the earlier you can start with the stuff, the better. But even if, even if it's been a while, like, uh, you know, I, I literally have clients of mine that are like 50, 55 years old, and they've been able to change tremendously in a way that makes them be the real you, them mm -hmm. in front of other people. And so it's definitely possible for people of all ages, but definitely the earlier you start, the better for sure. Yeah. And I mean, the teen years are the teen, the years where your brain is most malleable, right? So yeah. it's the best opportunity to, to address this and stop it. So I, I, I love that you shared the analogy with the, with the leg, because I think when we physically can see something, it's easy for us to process. But when it comes to the brain and brain health, we can't see it. And so I think a lot of people don't still do not believe it exists. And you see a lot of just suck it up, just, just mm. do it, which actually makes it even worse because now the kid's feeling like something is really broken with me. And it's not mm. where you're saying, and I love this is you're separating out the anxiety from the person. So it's not who they are. It's something that they're trying to manage. So you mentioned some tips. Can you provide some tips? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I would say is, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people don't think of when it comes to anxiety and even social anxiety is that um, the University of Maryland did this study. And what they did was they basically looked at how your brain interacts with this thing called your gut microbiome for people with social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you, whenever you eat something, your body goes through this entire process of digesting that food from like the saliva to you chewing it, then the food going down, getting burned through your stomach acids, and then going to this thing called the gut microbiome. And basically, we have this vast ecosystem of trillions of bacteria in our gut microbiome that is heavily connected with, with our brain. And so basically what they found in this study, um, I ended it with like college students. Basically what they found is that college students who were able to take better care of their gut microbiome 
which there's a lot of ways you can do, but it's really through your diet. It's really through mm-hmm. the food that you eat, your nutrition. They actually saw, I forget what the exact percentage is, but they saw a reduction of social anxiety symptoms. So what I would say is a lot of times people don't connect, but what you put on your fork every day has a huge impact on your brain and actually has a huge impact on social anxiety. And so Mm -hmm. I'm obviously, I'm not saying like, Hey, if you eat a salad, your social anxiety (laughs) is going to be cured. Right. However, if you're able to like eat healthy and over a course consistently and over a course of like six months, what you may realize is that your overall like general level of anxiety that's in your nervous system goes down by a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, for example, people with social anxiety, I think the statistics is is like 60% of people with social anxiety also have some sort of a digestive stomach Mm -hmm. intestinal type issue. And like, for example, literally when my social anxiety started, that's also when I had a ton of other stomach problems as a kid, I had to get my appendix taken out. And like, for example, there was a study done by um, Mass General, and I'm here in Boston, and they actually showed that specifically in adolescence, there's a huge connection between anxiety and other stomach intestinal issues. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times they go hand in hand. And so I would say that's probably one of the biggest tips that I can give. And then I can give two more. Um, Number two is um, one of the ways that you can start to reprogram your identity and let um, sort of like bullying and discrimination, anything you face in the background, um, not affect you as much is through practicing mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure maybe you've had other guests on this. I'm sure maybe you've talked about meditation and how important it is. But one of the reasons why is because Um, And there's many forms of meditation, but what I'm speaking on is mindfulness meditation has specifically like been shown in scientific studies to help treat social anxiety uh, equally, if not more effective than therapy and other kinds Mm -hmm. of medication. And what they found was that um, when you sit down and you close your eyes and you shut down your physical environment and all you're focusing on is your breath your brain is going to start sending you all these different kinds of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times what you start to realize is by sitting down every day in the morning, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and you're in this practice to where you're disconnecting and you're sort of seeing all these thoughts in your brain, what starts to happen is you start to disconnect from your own thoughts Mm -hmm. which then leads you to what you just said before of like, it leads you to understand that you're not your anxiety. And what starts to happen is all of a sudden you start seeing these thoughts that maybe um, someone insulted you with, someone insulted you with, or someone bullied you with. And what happens is your brain internalizes these thoughts and then repeats them in your own voice. And so when you do this meditation, you actually start to see this in front of your eyes and you start to actually gain a distance and you start to create your own sense of identity, which tremendously helps your your mind, your emotions. So that's number two. And then the last one that I would say in terms of social anxiety is doing this practice called exposure therapy. Now, there's all different ways to do this. You can do this by yourself. You can do this with a professional. If you're a parent, you can do this with your kid. And so basically what this is, is you sort of take a fear and you break it down into layers. So for example, um, are we still good on time, by the way? Yep. Yeah, we're fine. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just a little bit of a tangent. I'm about to go on. Um, no, that's so, great. The beauty of having my own podcast, I can go as long as I want. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, so when it comes to behavior, social anxiety can be broken down into four layers. Mm-hmm. The first layer of social anxiety is your physical appearance. And so people will get socially anxious yeah. around their physical appearance, their skin, their weight, how their face looks, their clothes. Number two is people will get socially anxious about their social skills. They'll feel like, I don't really know how to introduce myself. I don't know how to talk to people. How do I have a conversation? What happens if there's a a pause in the conversation? It gets awkward, all this stuff. Then people will get socially anxious around um, their entire personality or their character. And this kind of happens as um, just like, uh, like a side effect of just facing social anxiety. And the last one is people will get socially anxious around 
the signs of anxiety itself. So mm-hmm. if you're in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden you start blushing, then a part of your mind is like, oh, wait, can people tell that I'm blushing yeah. because you're anxious? And then it starts this anxiety on top of this anxiety. And so basically what you can do with this exposure therapy is break down each one of those layers and systematically expose yourself to them. So for example, mm-hmm. um, you know, for me, one of the biggest things that I learned is that um, in kind of like the small town that I grew up in, this small town was pretty affluent. Uh, most people there had money. Uh, but my family didn't. We had no money. And so I remember going to school a lot of the times just wearing the same clothes Mm -hmm. because I just didn't have other clothes. And so I remember just like this constant layer of social anxiety around my clothes and around how I looked, including like my skin color and all these different things. And so one of the ways that I started to practice exposure therapy uh, with that um, is I started to purposely wear the craziest clothes in public situations. Now, before I say this, I just want to give like a disclaimer. I highly, highly do not recommend doing this, what I'm talking about, exposure therapy, if this is like your first time doing anything for social anxiety. And so mm-hmm. I, I recommend exposure therapy if, you're, if you've been on this journey for like the last six months over a year. But if you're just getting started, I don't recommend doing this because you're probably not going to be able to do it successfully, yeah. which will probably hurt your self-esteem even more. And so you want to practice like mindfulness meditation and your nutrition and the gum microbiome more. Um, and then you can go to exposure therapy. And so for example, like one of the things that I would do is I'd go to like the mall and I would wear like these bright pink neon shirt and like tight shorts and like <laughs> a pink cowboy hat. And I'd rock around the mall and basically, you know, that basically conditions your brain to not care about what other people think about you. Mm. Because a lot of the times when you have social anxiety, even if you're not wearing those clothes, your brain is already telling you that. Your brain is already telling you people are looking at you, people think you're weird, whatever it is. So then when you wear these clothes and you actually do kind of look a little weird (laughs) and then you see people, eventually, if done alongside some of these other tools that I mentioned, this is how you can like start to decondition and start to unwire some of these mm. layers of social anxiety. And then, for example, if you're a parent and you're a kid uh, and you're talking about dealing with your teen or kid, what you can do is if there are any uh, like events or if there's, you know, I don't know if you're having people over your house or what have you and you know your kid is facing social anxiety, what you can do is like, you need to create some sort of a safe space for them. So a lot of the Mm -hmm. times that's with their mom. could be with their dad. It could be somewhere. But what's really great is this. Have a safe space to where you communicate with your kid and you tell them, hey, if you ever like feel nervous or if you ever don't want to be here or something happens, I want you to know that it's okay to like come to me and you can just like talk to me and we can just sort of handle things out. And then what will happen is if you can do that effectively, a lot of people think like, oh, if I do that, my, my kid is going to get soft or it's not going to work. But what happens is if you can do that, the kid actually feels a sense of safety. And then once they feel safe enough, they can actually, they'll leave your side and then they'll go play with whatever other kids or whatever. And then if their social anxiety gets triggered again, they know to sort of have like a safe space to you to come back. Yeah. Uh, with. So whether it's like a birthday party or whatever you're at with your kid, that's a very, very, very effective technique. And, and it's important to do that without like a sense of judgment or without of like, oh, the other kids are looking at you, like, don't be shy, all this stuff, like never, never do those things. And if you'll do that, what will eventually happen is the kid will have the, their own sense of safety to where eventually they don't even have to do that with you. And the social anxiety goes down a lot less. So that's another example that parents can do with their teens. Um, and, and also that tip was given to me um, by someone by the name of Andrew Reiner. He's like a, a, a professor at this, um, at this college that I'm forgetting on, but he kind of told me that that practice, it works very well. That's really cool. I, I have a, when you're saying that though, I'm thinking with teenagers um, and adults, I think one of our safety zones is our phone. So <laughs> I think, right? Like we all like we're uncomfortable. Let's just pretend look, we're look at our phone. So yeah, <laughs> I think, and that's an easy one to go to. So how do we kind of 
um, navigate that where we don't become dependent on our phone to the point where we lose our ability to, to not turn to our phone really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I would say is I'm, I, I don't think I'm an advocate of that. I don't think, I don't think I would recommend people to use their phones as safe zones. Although I know like there's this quote and it's like, um, you know, the, the, the modern phone is like an adult pacifier. It is. Um, you know, and, 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 and I've definitely done it too, for sure. Um, but what I would say is this, I would say is that anxiety is fed through avoidance. So if you're doing anything to avoid something, that's not a good idea, right? So if you're like, for me, like when I was a kid, my bathroom was my safe zone. So like literally I would go to the bathroom like eight times, like if I was at an event and it's, you know, maybe I had to go to the bathroom like once or twice, but it was really just to get away from everything. And that was sort of like my safe zone. And yeah, if I did that like once or twice or three times, that's fine. But as a kid, I would literally live in the bathroom. Like I would just mm -hmm. stay there the entire time. So that, that avoidance, that's not good. But if I were to use it as sort of like a safe zone and have like different boundaries, then maybe that would be okay. You know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know in terms of that, but one thing that I do know is that, yeah, avoidance just makes things worse. And honestly, like for me, if I'm ever going to go to like a, you know, social event or whatever, I honestly try not to, to use my phone. And, and what I would say to people too, is that maybe not if you're just starting out, but if you have been on your social anxiety recovery journey for a while, what I would say too, is I think it's a great idea to challenge yourself to, to not do anything that makes it easier for you. Um, mm. And, and maybe this wouldn't apply to teenagers, but um, you know, in terms of like, whenever I go to an event, I try not to use my phone. I try not to drink alcohol because I know that these things, they make it easier and they weaken the sort of muscle that I have yeah. to have built given my history. Um, and a lot of the times if, if those things kind of get weakened, um, it, it sort of weakens my own ability to do that, which then it kind of impacts my self-esteem. And so, yeah, I would say that for people who are like been years on their journey. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, this has been so helpful and I really, really appreciate all the advice that you're giving. How do people find you? Yeah. So the best spot for people to find me is if you go to my website, which is just my first and last name.com, um, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-R-Y.com. Um, you can see links like my podcast, my book, my program that you mentioned at the beginning, um, my book's also like on audio on 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 the audiobook audible version. Um, and yeah, the best spot is just my website and and I have like an email newsletter people can put in their email. Um, I always I make it as as easy as possible to for people to reach out to me. So I, if anyone has like any questions or so sorry. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, I have all these timers on my phone. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. That's I'd be that's happy wonderful. To them. And this was Thanks. awesome. Yeah. So any parting words of encouragement for parents with teenagers? Yeah. Here's what I would say. I would say um, you, you need to be a beacon of hope and of light to your kid. And the reality is, is that you cannot force them. So a lot of the times what I've seen is that, mm. um, you know, parents of kids who are very shy or socially anxious, a lot of the times, like, you know, it's do out of love they're like, you know, why are you so shy? You're like, Hey, yeah. let's get them the help they need. And of course, all that stuff is great. But the reality is, is that you cannot force them. And, and I think if you can, you know, if you force someone, um, it can not, you know, it can be so not so good. And, and there's that quote that's like, it's not, it's not what you do or even why you do it. It's how you do it. Yeah. So I think again, like if you're, if you have a kid and they're suffering, uh, even though you love them, um, don't force them to like talk to people or don't force them because a lot of the times that kind of stuff backfires. And so um, you need to be like a beacon of, of, of hope and light. And, um, and listen, like we live in a time in 2021 where you literally have access to the world's greatest teachers, the world's greatest tools and resources. It's all out there mostly for free. And so, um, you know, you can do that or, you know, you can get lost in like video games or, or maybe not parents or maybe they do. It's, <laughs> parents do too. People can do whatever they want. People yeah. can do whatever they want. But uh, that's what I'd say. Don't force it. Help them yeah. and kind of be a friend to them and do things with them that can help them.
Yeah. I, I think that's so important too, because as parents, I think we get very like, we get so worried and we get a little frenetic about, oh my gosh, mm. we got it. We got to fix this. We got to fix this. And um, it does. We try to push it a little bit too fast and then they become more resistant to it. Yeah. So, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's Mark. very hard. It's so hard. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful you could join us today. This is so fun. Thank you for starting my, my day right. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, parents, for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us. If you want to learn more about how to help your teens thrive, you can grab my top 10 secrets for raising teens at askdrcam.com slash parenting tips. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode and all the helpful strategies Mark shared with us, please take a quick moment to rate and review. This helps other parents like you find this show. I encourage you to share it with a friend as well. Until next time, have a peaceful, positive, calm, day.